In this episode of Detroit Performs, University of Michigan students speak for a community through a mural, learning history through music, and growing environmental art. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding is also provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to Detroit Performs. I'm your host, DJ Oliver, and today I'm headed to the newly renovated State Theater in Ann Arbor. We'll learn more about this theater throughout the show, but let's get to our first segment. University of Michigan students are bringing environmental issues to light by creating murals around our community. We met up one of the groups whose focus was on the pollution damaging the 48217 area. Our community, 4217, is known for its stink. This is the most polluted zip code in the state of Michigan. Our community should not be casualties for industry's greed. Based on the recent election and funding for Great Lakes environmental issues, uh, last year in the call for new courses, I decided it was good timing for us to get the students out and partner with uh, some local communities to bring in, uh, environmental issues more out into the public sphere. This isn't our voice, this is the community's voice. We go to school at University of Michigan, we don't live here, and we are painting this mural, but we can only learn from the people that live here because this is really their situation. The mural came about after I was asked to do what we call toxic tours by the University of Michigan. And I took a group of students and some professors on a tour around the industry that has been plaguing our community and been one of our challenges for years with their emissions of pollution that is impacting my community. Miss Teresa Landrum is extremely passionate and inspiring and so I thought she'd be a perfect person to connect with for this class. This is one of the first African American establishments after World War II, but I grew up in this. I've always noticed the smells, so we accepted it as a norm, but it's not normal. I really feel disheartened that this has gone on so long from the industries and nobody paid attention. That minority, low-income communities are being impacted so severely by these industries that pollute. Residents in this area, they're fighting a system that allows them to be in sacrifice zone. And they're not doing good because their lives are inundated with the pollution and the health impacts from all of it. Students have certainly noticed you know, depending on which way the wind is blowing, you'll notice more odor than other days. Uh, but to hear the stories of, you know, particulates that are, you know, covering cars, and it's not hard to imagine covering lungs. The pollution that is coming from these surrounding industries is having a serious impact on our health. We see a high rate of lung cancer in this area. We see a high rate of COPD in this area. We have a high rate of asthma among our children, as well as adults. Working with these students have been wonderful because after the toxic tour, they said, what can we do? They decided among themselves that we need to do something. It's part of a growing environmental awareness that students have to go through and how can they become more empathetic to the folks that are living with the pollution uh, because we're all taking part in this because we're all, you know, living with cars and you know, we all use electricity, and so pollution is just, it's hidden from most of us most of the time. A lot of these situations are in communities of color, communities of low income, and so really wanted to target 
the injustices that lie there, and Ms. Landrum helped us a lot with that. This mural speaks because it gives us a voice. It creates conversation. People are stopping and asking, well, what is the mural about? How did it come about? Well, then we can discuss, well, there's been pollution issues out here all the time. I was born and raised out here, but I've also been working with the community for about 15 years. So in all of these years of working together, this mural is one of the things that has been one of the high points. It's just about initiating change as best as a mural can within the community, basically to promote justice. Also, it was really important for us to be able for the community members to be able to see themselves and their situations within the mural. On the very far left, we have kind of the silhouette of the looming industry, and coming out of that is the monster of industry who has the hazardous sign for the eyes. The uh, smoke coming out of his mouth is the basically representation of the pollution, the pollution on his back with the industry as well. And then we have the three figures and we wanted to represent different age groups um, from the community that was really important to us as well and uh, specifically also representing um, women because Miss Landrum was saying that a lot of the people that are involved in this fight are women and they're all in a fight towards stopping this big monster of industry and um, really stating their claim on um, the power that they have with their voice. And then the sunflowers that we have are kind of like a representation of more of a brighter hope. Miss Landrum was telling us how they had done protests before with sunflowers on their signs with messages in between. So we took that and added it in and then mirrored that with the gears on the other side. The images speak to me because it lets you know that community, we're becoming aware and we're tired. And it addresses that we need somebody to stand up and say, stop. We're telling the companies, we're telling the city, we're telling the state, we're telling the federal government, work with us and help stop this pollution and industry from encroaching more and more on communities. I hope that the people can just really see that their fight is recognized and that there are people who are with them, supporting them, and that their work every day matters. Inspiring change is, you know, get, making topics visible and letting people uh, see and understand it and, and acknowledge that there is a problem and, you know, how can they come together to help fight it and, you know, Teresa will be, continue to be, I'm sure, a strong voice in the community. You can learn more about the 48217 mural, as well as all the artists we feature on DetroitPerforms.org. Connecting art with history. That's the big reason we go to museums, right? How about connecting music with history? That's where Quincy Stewart comes in, a music teacher bringing African-American stories to his students, along with a little Detroit history, too. I'm famous in room 213. That's the only famous I am, is I'm famous in room 213. My name is Quincy Stewart III. I'm 59 years old. And I'm the band director here at Detroit Central High School. I'm a musician. I went to school for music. That's what I love to do. And I perform and play and all that kind of stuff. But funny things happen on the way to what you want to do. And that choir approach. Today is my first hour class. It's a music appreciation class. And I woke up this morning with my mind. That whole church gospel feel has gone from that to incorporating R&B. This music appreciation class deals with music and history. Now, that's the civil rights, that's kind of the civil rights thing. And you heard this a lot during the civil rights movement. Choir style songs. It doesn't make sense to teach a music appreciation class and say, okay, this is Coltrane. This is Charlie Parker. This is Duke Ellington. This is Jimi Hendrix. This is the Delphonics. And you don't even know what framed that music? What caused them to write that? What time were they living in when they wrote this? And it explains volumes about why that music exists. So you're hearing more determination here. This is right in 65 with the Edmund Pettus Bridge incident where 
Blacks were beaten by state troopers. For a young black kid to know about the things that occurred in our history that are still happening today, it seems to always be some kind of reticence about that. Anybody ever heard this song before? Never? Listen to the words. I'm a black man first, not a teacher first. And as a black man, knowing our history and knowing what it is that we have to do for these kids to be educated about their history, it's an easy combination for me to put the music and the history together. They work hand in hand. Never heard this before? It's kicking though, ain't it? Oh, you, you mean tell me y'all ain't feeling that? Y'all so far gone that you don't feel that? Since I've taken this class, I've become more aware of how to find certain messages within music. They may say, I'm like a bird, and it means more than just, I'm like somebody who flies. It means that I can be free, or I can go where I want, or my destination isn't far because I have the power to fly. On 12th and Claremont, everybody know what that is? You know what Claremont is, right? Today, we're gonna be looking at the music of the 60s, but we can't take a look at that unless we take a look at what occurred here in Detroit on July 23rd, 29th, 1967. And you can't say it was a riot because a riot is something aimless without a goal, without anything in mind. What does the word rebel mean? You know, I've had kids walk out and say, Mr. Stewart, I didn't even know that, man. They should have taught me that. And they feel a sense of gratitude and outrage. And I think both are legitimate. Gratitude that they're getting it, outrage that they didn't get it before now. You're in the 12th grade, and you don't know who Marcus Garvey is. Marcus Garvey is a general figure. That's right. But they know who Benjamin Franklin is. They know who Thomas Jefferson is. So let's look at the actors in this scenario. Lyndon B. Johnson was the president. Lyndon Baines Johnson. Let me give you some background on Lyndon B. Johnson. Lyndon B. Johnson was a Southern, well, he was a Southern white guy. Um, has always been somewhat of a liberal. By 1967, Lyndon B. Johnson had done some pretty good things. He had gotten the 1965 Voting Rights Act passed. He got the 1964 Civil Rights Bill passed. He worked with Dr. King against a lot of Southern resistance, who basically called Lyndon B. Johnson a, a white Uncle Tom. So Lyndon B. Johnson, in his own way, did some things to assist black folks to be honest with you, he did more than Obama's done, <laughs> which is really interesting, isn't it? Before I had these classes, I didn't know a lot about African-American history. Uh, I'm glad that it's now instead of never. We have a soundtrack to our lives. The tune What's Going On by Marvin Gaye. From the time I was 14 years old, the Vietnam War was raging. Of course, the Algiers Motel incident in 1967 with three young black men killed by the police in cold blood. What's going on to me culminated all of that for me. It kind of brought it all together. It's a question, and it's not a rhetorical question. It is a real question being posed by Marvin Gaye. What is going on? And until we get an answer to that question, I think it's a song that's going to last through history. What's up, guys? I am here with the executive director of the Michigan Theater and State Theater here in Ann Arbor, Russ Collins. How you doing? Good. How are you, DJ? I am good. Good, man. Thank you. So tell our viewers out there a little bit about the State Theater and how this place came about. Sure. Well, the State Theater originally opened in the 1940s, 1942 to be exact, and it was an Art Deco theater designed by a very famous architect by the name of C. Howard Crane, who also designed the Fox Theater in Detroit and Orchestra Hall in Detroit right. and the Detroit Opera House. Actually, um, about 60 theaters in the Detroit area and about 300 theaters around the world. And in, 19, in the late 1980s, uh, they put a Urban Outfitter store on the main floor, but they kept the balcony to show movies, but it was pretty run down. 
So starting in 2014, we were able to purchase the balcony area um, and we, we renovated the theater in a historically sensitive way. So the, what you see around you is all brand new, uh, but we used uh, the carpeting, the original carpet pattern, some uh, original wall sconce designs, which were executed by artisan in Detroit. And they're beautiful, beautiful wall sconces. I agree with that. <laughs> and uh, we have four screens and uh, we show specialty films, um, although we did play Star Wars for a few weeks <laughs> I know the when we open. Love that one, man. Absolutely. And so we'll do lots of different things, uh, uh, combining the screens at the Michigan Theater, which is a 1920s movie palace, and the State Theater, which was designed around a cinema-style theater. What's the response been like uh, to this theater reopening? It's been overwhelming. Okay. Uh, we, we've sold out a lot of the screenings. You know, it's passionate movie peoples, young and old, come to, to see movies at the State and the Michigan Theater. And we're uh, understandably, I think, proud of this uh, new venue. Absolutely, you should be. This place is absolutely beautiful. What have you had done? Well, to b make it a four screen theater, we had to do some very special engineering um, over a space that uh, used to be the air space between the front of the balcony and where the screen was. And some very clever engineering and wonderful, extremely talented iron workers were able to make the structure work. And, um, and we were able to do some fun things. All right, so last question, Russ. What's your favorite part about working in this theater and why? Well, I get to, to work with the community in lots of different levels. It's just a tremendous honor to be connected to a project that is enthusiastically supported by a diverse community. And uh, um, so that's exciting to me. And then I get to see movies and have popcorn. <laughs> so that's not a bad fringe benefit. All right, thank you very much, Russ. Absolutely. Time. We'll see you at the movies. All right. <laughs> now let's check out some upcoming events happening in and around the D. Environmental sculptor Roy Staub is internationally known for his site-specific installations. His work is designed to go up and then decay in its surroundings. Check it out. Sculpture for me is big drawings. The magic of making this work for 33 years is that that moment it comes together and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of and excited that it happens. The Villa Terrace Decorative Arts Museum will be celebrating 50 years as a public institution next year in 2017. It was the original home of Lloyd and Agnes Smith of the A.O. Smith Corporation. Agnes Smith donated the mansion to the community in 1967 and we've been enjoying it ever since. We're a community arts-based organization that features local, regional, and Wisconsin-based artists with three changing exhibitions um, every year. This is the Renaissance Garden, and it uh, came into being in 2001. And it's a, a classical garden, so that it, we're working with symmetry, and it has some classical sculptures and features to it. So we do a variety of things here, and what's great about uh, Roy Staub's exhibition is that it's the first time that we've done a site-specific sculptural installation in the garden. He is a locally based, site-specific environmental artist, and he does work all around the world, and I mean, he's just a, a local treasure. I call my work environmental because I use the materials from the environment, and also the site is close to the materials. 
The reeds are weeds, nobody cares about them, but they're growing right where I'm working. Now here I'm not using reeds, but I'm using willow. And willow grows by the lake and in an abundance, so I can pick it and it'll grow easily again. Every year I try to look for a form I could use as I progressed or changed. And then I f somebody told me about ovals. And a rounded form is better in nature than a square line when it's real long. So I'm, I'm using ovals, squares, rectangles, triangles, and it's in line. My vocabulary is line. When Roy works, he really kind of meditates on the space that the piece is going to be constructed in. And so here at the Villa Terrace, being a formal classical garden, um, he's really looking at the symmetry um, and playing off of that as well. We call it shadow dance. Why shadow dance? Because it's on this beautiful grass. It's going to be linear and there's a shadow on below it. This is a formal garden. There's a, a channel going down the middle and a crisscross, and that's the axis like most formal gardens have. My vocabulary is ovals and circles, and that's what I'm using on this piece. And they're overlapping, and it's all about space. Sculpture is space. So this piece is made specifically for this site. That's the size I can get, and I went maximum. The process of making the work is you have to collect the materials. Then you have to lay out the work. Then you have to put it together. It all takes time. I used willow, and this is a wild willow. It grows in nature in clumps by the water, and we spend five hours picking this material. So it will be willow, and the horizontal, I want it to be very clear. Grass is green, and I'm gonna use reeds again. When they're bundled, they're strong. So I will use those reeds uh, as the horizontal work, a graphic work, to be seen from above and to be uh, sensed in the environment where you are down here. So we have a circle. We have an oval going through the circle. And as the formal garden has oval, 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 oval. And this will make the piece. You put them in, it's like a very simple thing, and then I weave the line, I'll, put the, I'll attach the line. Woven, I'll be woven and bundled, and I'll attach it to these uh, supports. It's all about balance and engineering of the work. That's what an artist has to do, design and engineering it and making it happen. We work when we have to work. Um, process. You never know how long it's gonna take, exactly. You just work until you're done. It's not a nine to five job. You work until it's dark, come back the next day, work again and again until it's completed. When the piece is done, I want it to be seen from on top. And I want you, I want you to see a magical form of line. Uh, a line that is this formal garden in my vocabulary look at it from the terrace you can kind of get the visual it's like kind of looking at a labyrinth from above where you can see all the twists and turns and then when you come down and get into it you have a completely different perspective and we're hoping that they interact with the sculpture it's definitely something that's meant to be walked in and around and interacting with the site-specific sculpture is only one part of the exhibition. We are also having a retrospective of photographs from Roy's work from around the world. And that's kind of the interesting thing with environmental site-specific art, is that it's meant to be temporary. It's made from nature, within nature, and it's meant to decay into atrophy. And so really how that lives on is that photographs and videos are taken. And then this, the third part is um, a collection of baskets from John Shannon and Jan Sayre that Roy curated. So he went and picked a number of these baskets that are made with some of the same materials that he works with. And um, we're going to have these exquisite baskets on display as well. When people come to my, to my sculpture, I hope they find a kind of quietness and a peace. Peace in, in what nature is supposed to give you. So I hope they take away a peacefulness and an intellectual play of my geometry. Art has to be art. It's not about money, it's about beauty and what you can give to other people because art is sharing.
And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on coming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to thank the State Theater for having us out here today to enjoy this beautiful engineering marvel. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I'm DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Maryland cabinets, and their brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding is also provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.